All right. Uh, welcome officially uh, to the Project Management Body of Knowledge 7 or PMBOK 7 uh, for short, short course with IT Masters and Charles Sturt University uh, this evening or depending on your location this morning, this afternoon, this evening or this night. Um, thank you all for coming along. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. My name's Jack Stewart. Um, I am a course advisor and eligibility assessment officer with IT Masters. Um, and I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm presenting this from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and pay respect to their elders and ancestors, past and present, um, and acknowledge that their sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so I'll be your MC for this webinar and for the duration of this course. Uh, your mentor for this course is Karen Wright, who's an adjunct lecturer in project management at Charles Sturt University. And uh, wherever you are watching this from in the world, which we know from the chat is a lot of different places, we hope that you are safe and well. Uh, so just before we begin properly, I will do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so all the webinars for this course will be held at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So recordings will be made for anyone who can't attend on a given occasion. Um, if you can make it, we do hope you will attend the live webinars and contribute to a collaborative learning environment. Um, evidently, as you can probably tell from the fact that we're all here on Zoom, we do use Zoom for our webinars. Um, and we really like to encourage questions and the use of the chat throughout the course. Um, and just to uh, direct those kind of chats and questions, um, all questions that are relevant to the course context, uh, con content sorry, specifically, um, please direct to the Q&A section um, and then the administration type questions, so dates, times, resource availability and, uh, and similar things uh, to the support team in the chat. Um, so if you've got a specific question that's just for the support team, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, you can chat with the panelists only um, or to fellow students as well. So feel free to discuss the course content with fellow students uh, by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log um, and selecting everybody or just a panelist if you have a question that's specific to the administration of the course. Um, there are often uh, some very uh, highly experienced attendees who can be very helpful with questions that you may have. Uh, and their insights can often uh, uh, help out with our content as well. And there'll be Q&A sessions at the end of the webinars, uh, or there might be some opportunities throughout the webinar to um, ask some questions about particular content as well. Um, so we've got here tonight, we have Hannah uh, in her usual moderation role for IT Masters with the help of Kit. Um, and the two of them are responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu.au website, which is where you'll find the other materials uh, needed for the course. Uh, so that's links to the readings, discussion forums, quizzes, etc. Um, so if you've got any questions tonight or later on, please feel free to give us a contact using the details on that learn.itmasters.edu.au page. Um, and for everybody that's never taken part in an uh, IT Masters short course with us, welcome uh, for your first time. Really pleased to have you here. Um, just really quick background. We're a training organization. We exist as a partner to CSU. So we work with uh, CSU to uh, Charles Sturt University to create and deliver a number of masters and graduate certificate courses. Uh, and we market these courses on their behalf. And so we believe that the best way to do that is to give away some of it for free because we think that the course content is good enough that it speaks for itself. Um, and if students are interested, then uh, some exposure to this course content uh, would be enough to encourage you to enroll in a full length course if that's your goal. Um, you're, of course, extremely welcome to simply take the short courses. You can take as many as you like um, without obligation. But the relevant full-length courses for this short course are the Graduate Certificate, Diploma or Master of Project Management. Um, and you can check out the details of that uh, with the link that I am just putting in the chat now. Um, 
So the content for this short course is based on the subject MGI 511 Project Management Fundamentals, uh, which is an industry subject based on the Project Management Institute, PMI, as it will be referred to throughout the course methodology. Um, and it prepares students for the project management professional or similar certifications. Um, Karen, who's the host for this short course, is the subject mentor for this subject, um, as well as a number of the other project management focused subjects, such as agile project management in her role as adjunct lecturer with CSU. Uh, so with that said, once again, feel free to use the chat for contacting other students uh, or the administration side of things, the Q&A to ask course specific questions and uh, without further ado please welcome Karen Wright please make her welcome in the chat and in general thank you Jack and thank you everyone great to see uh, so many of you this evening uh, from all around the world in fact it's wonderful um, so as um, Jack said uh, I work at IT Masters uh, lecturing in lots of the project management subjects tonight's um, short course it's going to go for four weeks so I'm going to occupy your Thursday nights in, in June a fair bit um, but we're going to be talking about the uh, the Pinbox 7 the project management body of knowledge uh, 7 and uh, it's not intended to be an exhaustive uh, course in, in terms of the all of the content that's in, in Pinbox 7 because it is quite a, a big publication, but it is going to give you uh, some insights into the, the broad basics of it uh, and, and give you information about you know, how it's all structured and, and some of the, the major elements of the content. Uh, so without further ado, I will get into that. Um, the first thing though that I would like to know, and we're going to run a poll this evening, uh, is whether or not you have any level of familiarity with the past editions of the project management body of knowledge. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the box at all. Um, the, the Project Management Body of Knowledge is published by the Project Management Institute, which is a global professional body of project managers. Uh, and they're now up to the seventh edition, of course, which is what's going to be the focus of our short course over the next four weeks. But of course, they did have six earlier versions. Uh, and so I'm really keen to know whether or not you're doing this course as a bit of a bridging course to find out a bit more about Pinbox 7 with a, a good foundational knowledge already of six or, or earlier, uh, or whether you're brand new to project management and you've never picked up the box before. And it looks fairly even at this stage. Our poll's saying about 40% of you are familiar with box six or earlier, uh, and about 60% of you brand new to project management and have not looked at the box before. So that's really great to know. Thanks, guys for letting me know uh, about that. That just helps me to, uh, to work out, you know, where to, uh, to, to pitch it in terms of the knowledge for you guys. So for those of you who have never picked up a BOC before, uh, as I said, published by the Project Management Institute, it's intended to be a body of knowledge. It's intended to, to really uh, outline uh, all of the, the major things that a project manager would need to, to do in order to be able to perform his or her job effectively. Now, leading up to the release of Pinbox 7, um, the box structure remained fairly consistent across the first six editions, and it was made up of knowledge areas, which are uh, areas of um, you know, knowledge for, for project managers to have. So integration, scope, uh, scheduling, cost or budget, um, quality, resources, communications, risk, procurement and stakeholders. Stakeholders was one that was added in uh, in a couple of versions ago of PMBOK. Before that, there were nine knowledge areas, then there were 10. Um, and the standard for project management really carried forward five process groups. So it said, you know, you initiate a project, you plan a project, you execute your project work, uh, you monitor and control your project outputs, and then you know at the end you wrap up and you close your project. Now, many of you may uh, be familiar with waterfall or traditional project management, where you kind of plan your whole project up front, uh, and then you go ahead and execute your project, and then you know at the end you, you close it all off. Um, with project management in more recent times, there's been a shift towards more adaptive methods of project management, which means you know more agile ways of managing projects, where we don't plan the whole project up front; we just plan a portion of the project, and then we go and execute that and deliver some products and services. Uh, and then we continue to, to replan the next, next aspect of the project and so on. Um, and so in, in that, with that in mind, I guess, um, the PMI sort of looked at the way that, that the bot was structured, looked at the, uh, the knowledge areas and the process groups and, and uh, how many people felt that that was quite aligned to uh, the traditional waterfall uh, predictive approaches to project management and thought we really have to kind of adapt our way of thinking here to, to be more inclusive of other methods, more adaptive methods of project management. 
And so from that, uh, the, the box seven was written and it really is quite different from the ground up. So it's not just a, a minor tweak where we've just added another knowledge area or we've combined a couple of things together and we've changed a couple of the process groups. We haven't, uh, of course, we haven't in project management thrown out the knowledge areas and the process groups in terms of the way we run projects, but we're, the BOC has stopped referring to them as knowledge areas and process groups. So we now have the body of knowledge itself and the standard for project management. We still have those sort of two key parts um, to, to the BOC, um, but we are moving away from uh, the process groups and the knowledge areas into a new way of thinking, which is a system for value delivery. Uh, and 12 management principles or project management principles. So 12 principles that guide behaviour. And that's going to be the key focus of our, our webinar this evening. And then uh, across the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about what's in the, in the BOC itself, which is the eight performance domains. Okay, and then at the end, uh, the models, the methods and the artifacts that go along with that as well. So as you can see, very, very different. Um, and at the moment, if you were to sit the, uh, the PMI's project management professional or, or certified associate project management professional uh, certification, you would still be sitting it under the sixth edition. Um, I think there's going to be a, a time very shortly where they kind of move on to the seventh edition. Uh, they haven't yet, uh, but that will be coming. And so we are trying to prepare people for that by you know merging in with this new content now so if you were to do an IT master's course and you were to do MGI 511 which is our project management fundamental subject you'd be doing that on the new box not the old one so for those of you who are familiar with the knowledge areas and the process groups from box six uh, keep them in the back of your mind they haven't you know, completely lost their relevance altogether. Uh, but it, there is this, this new way of looking at projects that is made up of these uh, project management principles and performance domains. So I'm going to talk more about this as we go. Now, um, one of the things that you may be interested in doing either throughout or after uh, the, uh, the webinar tonight or, or throughout the short course is getting yourselves a copy of the Project Management Body of Knowledge 7th uh, edition. Uh, I'm not here to, to promote or advertise PMI products uh, by any stretch, but uh, there are um, options available to you. You can just go to a bookshop, bookshop and buy uh, the Project Management Body of Knowledge. They are selling the seventh edition uh, now. It's been uh, you know, on, on the market since August last year, so there's plenty of copies available. Uh, however, the PMI do offer a free soft copy of the, the BOC when you join up as a member. So it may be worth going to their website, which is pmi.org, um, and having a look at the membership options there. And, and um, that way you get a free copy of the, the BOC when you join. It's a soft copy and it's password protected, but um, you know, at least uh, then when you, uh, when you do that, you're not having to you know, go and buy a, uh, an additional textbook. So uh, that's our poll results in there about who knows about the BOC and, and whatnot. Uh, we'll go uh, further into depth now and have a look at what, um, what these performance domains and what these, um, these um, uh, behaviours are, these uh, principles that guide behaviour. Brilliant, Karen. So, um, sorry, yeah. just one moment with those mm -hmm. poll results. Um, since we've seen now that, yeah, about um, a few, a little bit less than half of the participants are familiar with the uh, previous editions and such. Just wanted to drop in again, just to tell a little bit of housekeeping. Um, reminder that if you've got administrative questions, such as accessing the materials uh, of the course on learn.itmasters.edu.au or any other similar questions about the way that the course is delivered, not the course itself, please direct those to the panelists section, host and panelists section in the chat. Uh, and if you've got questions specifically for Karen about the course content, that's the uh, material that you should be putting in the Q&A section of the chat. Thanks everyone. Excellent, thank you. So yes, yeah, so we're going to uh, cover the, the 12 um, principles of the guide behaviour in tonight's webinar. And then, uh, of course, they very closely align with the project performance domains. There are eight of those. Okay, so we're going to cut those into two sections. We're going to do uh, next week four of those and then the following week the other four. So over two weeks we'll cover the total of, of eight performance domains. And then we're going to spend the last week talking about um, how we tailor our projects because all projects are a temporary endeavour. We undertake them in order to create a unique product, service or result. So I guess there's two parts, two main parts to that definition. And one is that they're temporary. So they have a definite beginning and a definite end. Uh, and the other part is that they create a unique product, service or result, which is a one-off outcome uh, not to be repeated. 
Um, and so as a result of that, you know, we, we, um, there's certain things that we're going to do uh, as, as part of running our project. And those, uh, those things are going to depend on our approach to our project. As I discussed before, there's different ways of approaching projects. We can have a, a predictive approach, which is where we're going to plan everything up front and then go and deliver our project and then close it off. Or there's more sort of agile approaches that require you to plan only portions of your project and then, you know, deliver that portion and then sort of build on that minimum viable product as the project progresses so uh, depending on your approach might be you know how you how you work it might you know you might decide to use different models different methods different artifacts um, and so there's a whole third section of the book that's dedicated to tailoring uh, and we're going to to talk about that in the final week or the fourth week of our our short course so that gives you a fair overview of what we're going to uh, be covering over the next sort of four weeks as well uh, Karen, I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah. again. Uh, we just have a couple of requests in the chat to zoom the uh, slides in slightly, if that's possible zoom for you at all. Zoom slightly, excellent. Yes. All right. I some will people might be on some slightly smaller monitors. To do that, I tend to make them, hang on, make them. A uh, and for anyone bigger. that's not able to view the slides correctly, um, they will be available later on learn.itmasters.edu.au, but also please make sure that your uh, slides or, or that your Zoom is set to full screen as well. I am just trying to, I think it is set to full screen there now, so I'm not sure. Oh, I mean for, for, for participants. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, not a yep. problem. Um, no, that's yep. okay. Um, so what I'll, 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 I have tried to zoom in there. I don't think I can zoom in any further. That's one issue that I, I might have to. Uh, and also um, we have some uh, advice in the chat saying that participants are able to slide the screen across to make the PowerPoint bigger and the uh, presenter smaller. Um, so slides can be zoomed in by viewers as well. So that should be yeah. okay. Um, thank you very much, Karen. Sorry about that interruption. All right, no, that's okay. That's fine. So follow that advice and hopefully it will get a little bit bigger. Okay, so we are going to go through these in great detail anyway. So that was, I guess, a bit of a cover slide for you. Um, and uh, and then we're going to go through each of these um, in a lot of detail. So as I said, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing the performance domains. But tonight I'm going to cover these each of these um, 12 principles that guide behaviour in lots and lots of detail. So you're going to know them in and out by the end of this evening. Before I do get started though on the 12 principles that guide behaviour. Um, the PMI have come up with four values for project managers to adhere to or align with. Um, so these kind of underpin uh, the, the 12 principles that guide behaviour and they are responsibility, respect, fairness and honesty. So what we're talking about uh, when we are, um, are project managers is that, that we aren't accountable, we are not accountable for the delivery of our, our projects, that we have a, a governance layer, a sponsor, a steering committee, uh, people who are giving us the resources and, and guiding and directing the project from a governance layer. So they're accountable for the project delivery because they're the people who are going to make decisions. So for example, if I'm you know, running my project and uh, an opportunity comes up, up and I want to go and uh, you know, take advantage of that and I go and ask my sponsor for another $40,000 and three months to be able to, to take this extra work on and they say no, you know, they're accountable for having made that decision, not me, because that's that's their role, not my role. Um, and so responsibility, though, is, is what the project manager does. So the responsibility of the project manager is to lead the project team, uh, to provide uh, advice and information to the, to the sponsor or to the governance layer uh, of the project, depending on, uh, and you'll hear me say things like sponsor steering committee. Really what I'm talking about is the governance layer for the project there, so the person who sits above the project manager. Um, and, you know, it, it, the term or the name of the person uh, or the name of the role uh, will vary according to the method that you, you use and, and your school of thought on project management. But um, so, so we're responsible for the project. So we take the resources that are given to us by that governance layer. And it's our responsibility to lead the project team and produce those project outputs or produce those project deliverables. So we are responsible. And of course, we have to take responsibility uh, as project managers. Uh, we have to act respectfully, respectfully towards our project team, uh, respectfully in terms of the resources that we're using, uh, respectful of, of the project environment, both internal and external. Uh, acting with fairness as well. So we are leading a, a team of people. Uh, and as a result of that, we do have to act fairly and make sure that we're, we're you know, ethical in all of our dealings with, with other people. Uh, and honesty, of course, as well. So um, that, that sort of comes, out, comes down to ethical dealing and partly as well, and just making sure that we are honest, that we're, uh, you know, approachable people. 
And these uh, four values really underpin these next 12 principles uh, that I'm going to talk about, which guide the behaviour of a project manager. So um, let's get into those. First of all, uh, where the values and the principles lie within the BOC itself is in the first part of the BOC called the standard. So as I said before, there are three sections. The, the last section is to do with tailoring, the models, the methods and the artefacts. Uh, the middle section is the, the performance domains or the, the, um, the guide. They call it the guide to the body of knowledge. The first part, though, where the, the values are and, and the principles that guide behaviour is called the standard to project management. So the standard provides a basis for understanding project management and how it enables project outcomes. So basically what we're saying in the standard is that a project is something that we're going to do on a temporary basis in order to create a unique product, service or result, and that we can apply these values Values and we can apply these uh, principles that guide behaviour, regardless of the kind of project we're operating, regardless of its location, its industry, its size, or the, or the delivery approach that we're taking to the project. That the standard is the standard and it can apply to any project anywhere. So what the standard says is that there is more than one way of delivering projects and that there is no one best way. That what we're saying is that in some cases that those predictive or traditional approaches to project management where we plan the whole lot up front and then we you know, go on and, and deliver the project is suitable um, in some situations. And yet there are other types of projects uh, where a more adaptive or agile approach is better, where we only plan portions of the project that we need to plan. And then we go and deliver those parts of the project and build a, a minimum viable product that we can then keep building on and growing as the project progresses. And then of course, there's hybrid uh, methods as well, which is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's where organisations say here at XYZ Corporation, we, we deal with these kinds of projects and we're going to take these bits of the predictive or the, um, the traditional approach to project management and we're going to use them. And then we're going to take these bits of the adaptive or the agile uh, methods of managing projects and we're going to apply them. So we end up with kind of a best of breed kind of mixed together or hybrid combination of, um, of project management approaches. And we answer questions about our projects like, you know, how's the project going to be governed? You know, what's the project management environment like? Uh, and what's the relationship between the project and the product? And by thinking through the answers to those questions, we can decide what is the best way for us to, to manage our project. But the standard applies regardless to any kind of project, as I said before, regardless of its, its size, its location or its, or its industry. Um, the other thing that's in the standard is some key terms and concepts that might be really useful for you to, to learn. Um, project management, unfortunately, for those of you who've been around project management for a while, you would be very familiar with the terms and concepts uh, that you come across on a day-to-day -day basis. But for those of you uh, who mentioned in the, in the poll that you've never come across the BOC before and you're brand new to project management, uh, then you might find that project management is fairly dense and thick and heavy in terms of new terms and concepts to wrap your head around. Uh, we're not going to try and cover all of them in, in our webinars, uh, but if you do end up getting yourselves a copy of the BOC, uh, do swing by the, the, the terms and con uh, concepts pages and have a good look through as to the meaning of some of these terms, which you may or may not have heard before. Um, but the main, one, main ones we're going to be focusing on is the fact that a, a, a project is a temporary endeavour that's undertaken in order to create that unique product, service or result. Uh, so it has a, a beginning and an end and it creates something brand new. Uh, and project management is the application of skills, tools and techniques to be able to, to bring a project to fruition. So it's the responsibility of taking the resources, the time, the money that's entrusted to us by our governance layer within our organisation and leading a project team to turn out that unique product, service or result. So some more key terms and concepts there uh, for you to have a bit of a think about uh, and uh, just work your way through uh, as you go uh, with those. Um, you know, some of them, as I said, might be re really new to you. Others, you know, you might have heard before in other business contexts um, or if you've been around project management before, no doubt you would have heard uh, a lot of them. The other one I want to focus on on this page is this thing called the system for value delivery. Now, obviously, I can't read everything that's in the chat box while I'm talking, but I did hear or did see uh, someone ask a question about that by the chat box early, earlier. So the system for value delivery is is basically all of the, the different projects that are programs and, and portfolios that are going on in an organisation in order to move it from point A to point B. So when you think about a project at its core and at its essence, it's really just a vehicle for change. Uh, 
It's a way to get us from where we are today, which is a, a place where we don't want to be. We've either got no opportunity or we've got a problem that we need to solve or, you know, we're falling behind the competition, whatever it is that's driving the organisation to do the project. And then, you know, in the future, we've got this sort of to be desired state where we want to get to, um, where our problem is solved and where we have, you know, great things happening in our organisation. And that should really be aligned to the organisation's strategic objectives. So the project just simply takes us from where we are today to where we want to be uh, and that's value delivery okay so the system for value delivery is how all of those different projects and programs within an organization all work together to to drive the organization towards its strategic objectives okay so uh that's it in a nutshell there that's taken straight out of uh the box there but the um the, the projects themselves individual projects that are running uh, and then you've got two or more projects that might have uh, some common ground uh, that you might deliver as a program. So generally the rule with a program is if, uh, if you've got two projects and you can put them together and achieve a greater result from putting them together than what you would get if you delivered them standalone, uh, then it makes sense to, to make a program of work out of it. Um, so, for example, if I were painting, if I were building two houses side by side, you know, I might decide to, to award the painting contract to the same contractor so that they can go and paint, you know, two houses at once instead of, you know, doing them separately and then I might save some money, all right? So just an example of, of how you can join projects together sometimes and achieve a greater outcome uh, than if they were to be delivered separately. And then, of course, portfolios are all the projects and, and programs that are being undertaken in that part of the organisation. So a lot of organisations have things like a, a capital works portfolio which is all their capital works projects and then they'll have an IT portfolio which is all their IT projects okay so um, some organizations also have a PMO or a project management office uh, and that's a, a separate area of the organization whose role it is to uphold project management standards within the organization and to really guide and direct the organization into you know being more mature and being more consistent in, your, in its project management approach so usually if you have a PMO uh, and you're a project manager uh, you will usually go and ask them for advice or help uh, or they will usually give you the templates to fill out for things like your status reports and you know those sorts of things as well so they're kind of like the um, the, the owners of the framework that you're operating in and uh, they usually provide guidance and direction to the rest of the organization on how to better perform uh, in terms of project management. So let's get on to the 12 principles. Here they are. So I'm going to uh, go through these very quickly on this slide and then I've got a slide for each of them and that's where we're going to wrap up tonight. Um, so remember, these are out of the standard. They're, they're guided by the, the four values that we talked about before. Um, and these are the principles that really should guide the behaviour of a project manager. So project manager, he or she, uh, in leading the project team, uh, in, in acting uh, in the best interests of the organisation and in taking the resources from that governance layer and, and you know, trying to create a, a product service or result, uh, you know, we should adhere to these, these 12 principles of project management. So the first one is to be a diligent, respectful and caring steward. So as I've said before, we're taking resources from the organisation. Most organisations, you know, don't hand out money and time and resources without a, an expectation of return on investment. So uh, it is up to us to take responsibility uh, and to be really careful uh, with the resources that are charged to us by our organisation and to act with integrity and care and trustworthiness and comply with any organisational policies and procedures that we might have uh, to comply with there in order to be a, a really diligent and careful steward of resources resources to get the job done. Uh, we're to create a collaborative team and environment. So uh, very seldom do projects get done by one person standing by themselves. It's usually a team effort. And usually those people will be made up of a range of different parts of the organisation. You might even have some people external to your organisation in on your project team. Uh, and so it's our role as project managers to make sure we've got a really collaborative team environment, uh, that we've got a good culture, that we've got some good team values going on, uh, that we've got, you know, um, we, we facilitate collaboration uh, between the people on our project team and we really bring a group of people together as a team with shared and common objectives which are to achieve for the project as well. Uh, to effectively engage with our stakeholders. So stakeholders are people who might have an interest in our project or might be influenced by our project. Uh, and so therefore we need to get their input as early as possible in the project. Uh, many, many projects have failed because people didn't get the right stakeholders 
uh, in on the project early enough uh, and they've come in too late and they've had all sorts of things to say but it's you know too late the horse has bolted and um, we haven't been able to to fix the problems once once that's happened so our job as project managers is to really effectively engage with stakeholders nice and early to make sure there's alignment between what the stakeholders want uh, and that we've been able to maximize their contribution to the project as well uh, we should always have a focus on value. This is one that was um, really born out of the Agile movement. Um, Agile particularly focuses on value. Um, all projects are there to provide a return on investment. No organisation wants to risk money and time and people uh, and effort only to end up with nothing at the end of the day. So um, our, our purpose of, of running the project is to get the organisation to a better place uh, and to get them to towards their strategic objectives. Uh, and so that means we need to keep our focus firmly on the value that we're creating. So that's about, you know, making sure that benefits are going to be realised, that we maintain an outcomes focus, and that really our projects are providing a, a contribution to the organisation strategy. I always say to project managers, when you, when you look at your, your project and the purpose of your project, and you look at your organisational strategic plan, you should be able to see a direct link between your project and the organisation strategy. If you can't see that, then uh, you know you may not. The project may not be a good idea. Uh, most organisations, you know, are running projects and committing resources because they want to head towards their strategic objectives. So all projects should really be focused on one or more of those objectives. Uh, the next one there is to recognise, evaluate and respond to system interactions. So projects operate in an internal environment, but there's also an external environment and there's lots and lots of different factors that are, that are at play. Um, at any one time, we've got lots of things going on uh, and, you know, we need to be able to respond to our environment. We need to be able to synergise different things together to be able to, to produce an outcome. Uh, and we're dealing with a very, very dynamic business environment at all times as well. Um, very seldom is the project environment the same at the start of the project as it is at the end. Most of the time on a six month, 12 month, two year project, you know, uh, lots and lots of changes are going to happen uh, during the life of the project. And we have to have the ability to respond to those changes as they happen and keep our project on track. Uh, demonstrate leadership behaviours is the next one. So, uh, you know, one of the earlier ones there talked about the project team and the project environment. We have to be able to demonstrate that we can lead a project team, which means exhibiting leadership behaviour. Um, now, project management is more than just allocating people to, to jobs um, and allocating resources to jobs. We need to be able to exert social influence. Half the time when you're running a project, you don't actually have any legitimate power over the people that are on your project team. Uh, you might be a, a project manager who's a manager, but, you know, some of the people working on your project team don't actually work for you. Uh, and so, you know, you need to be able to lead people and you need to be able to uh, get people to do what you want them to do, not because you've told them, but because they want to do it for you. Uh, and so that requires good communication skills, uh, the ability to negotiate and facilitate, and of course, good conflict resolution skills as well. So sometimes within the project team, there'll be conflict. Sometimes between your project team and another person's project team, there might be conflict. Uh, you've got to be able to you know, get in there and resolve that. To tailor based on context. So as we've talked about before, there is no one best way to manage projects and that depending on the, the, the type of project you're running, the type of product you're creating, you know, there might be different ways that you would go about your project. Now the standard is the standard regardless of the type of project, but there are things that we can tailor. Okay, so we tailor things to suit the situation. So this means getting the right approach and the right mix of things happening in our project to optimise project success. So we might be running a project, for example, that works really, really well with an agile approach, or we might be you know, running a project where, where waterfall or traditional project management might be more appropriate because the customer wants to know what they're going to get before we start. Okay, so that's a matter of, you know, it's horses for courses is what that one's saying there. Uh, that we need to build quality into processes and deliverables. Now, back when I learned project management many, many moons ago, uh, that uh, if you could manage a project to scope, to schedule and to budget, you were doing a pretty good job. Uh, these days, it's a bit more a bit more complex than that. They expect a bit more of us. Uh, and that is that we are expected to deliver a quality fit for purpose 
outcome, uh, a product that actually conforms and performs and satisfies. It's a tall order. Um, and so um, we need to make sure we are building quality into our processes and our deliverables, because if we don't end up delivering a quality outcome, the rest of it's wasted. All the money's wasted, all the time's wasted, all the people's efforts wasted. Uh, so we do need to make sure that we are building a quality product, service or result. The next one there is to navigate complexity. Uh, so most organisations are pretty complex beasts. We do have technology, we have people and we have processes and all of those elements need to be able to come together. Uh, but in addition to coming together, we need to be able to keep all of that on track at the same time. Uh, I did see a coffee mug recently that said project manager, you know, manager of projects. And the other uh, definition of that was herder of wet cats. I think that's about right. Um, you know, you do have to be able to navigate some pretty complex situations uh, and to be able to bring all of the different elements together. People that don't necessarily agree, processes that don't necessarily, al necessarily align, technology that doesn't necessarily talk to the, to the other pieces of technology that you need it to be able to talk to. So we do have to be able to uh, meet those challenges, navigate around that, find workarounds, find balances, find you know, ways of, of dealing with these problems. Uh, we also need to be able to optimise risk responses, which is um, dealing with those uncertain events that might impact on our project objectives. So risk can be, uh, uh, risk can have a dual nature in project management. So sometimes we have negative risks, which are threats, things that might come and, uh, you know, stop us from being able to achieve our, uh, our objectives. And we can also have, um, you know, positive uh, things too that might happen, such as opportunities that we want to take advantage of as well. Uh, we need to be able to embrace adaptability and resilience because we are working in such a dynamic uh, project environment most of the time. We do need that flexibility, that resilience and that adaptability to be able to you know, navigate the waters and to, to be able to, to chart a new course in the event that things go wrong and, and, and basically respond to setbacks because there will be setbacks. Uh, and the last one there is to enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. So we are moving from point A to point B here. We are going from a place where we don't want to be and we're trying to take the organisation, its people, its technology and its processes towards a future desired to be state. Uh, and in order, in order to do that, we need to be able to motivate people. So that's, you know, motivating people, being a change manager or a change champion uh, and really trying to influence people as well. All right, uh, excellent. So let me move into each of these in a bit more detail. These are straight out of the box. So as I said, uh, I, I have sort of um, made these uh, available to you so that you can see them. This is what was on that first slide that people were asking me to zoom in on. Brilliant, so, Karen. Um, I was yeah. just going to say, do you reckon uh, we have a moment for some question answering here? Would you like to move ahead with the content and do all questions at the end? Um, I'm happy to have some questions now if you like, yep. Great. We can, yeah. uh, we can do them. Yep. Um, so uh, we will work through some of the other questions um, just if for people that have asked questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, I think that there's uh, one that uh, seems quite relevant is what are the differences between project management and product management similarly to product manager and project manager? Okay, so product management is more around the actual product that you're that, that's being created. So uh, product management has a uh, more of a focus on I'm going to create this product, say this laptop or this bag or this folder, and we're going to produce multiple ones of those. So it's really about getting the product right so that we can you know replicate it over and over. Whereas project management is about creating something that's going to be a unique or a one-off outcome. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and another one that we have is uh, who determines what methodology works best for the organisation? Is the PMO the final authority or can the project manager decide for the team the best way to deliver the outcomes? So it would be the governance layer that would make the ultimate final decision. So if we have a sponsor or a steering committee, uh, normally, you know, if I go into an organisation as a consultant and, and they have a, a PMO, they would say, this is our methodology. And it might be a hybrid methodology or it might be an agile or whatever. Uh, and I could say to them, look, I really want to, uh, to I really think this approach might be best. Uh, and, you know, it would be up to the sponsor or the steering committee. Ultimately, they're accountable for the delivery of the project. So they're the final say on all decisions. Great, great. And um, maybe one further question for now, um, because I think it leads quite well into what you're about to discuss in just a second. Um, someone, uh, Rupak, asks, is risk management a major part of uh, 
managing projects or project management? Yes, it is. Um, so what we'll find is that there, there's a couple of, uh, of these principles that guide behaviour. Um, one that we talked about that was about optimising risk responses that relates to risk management. But there's also a whole performance domain called the uncertainty performance domain that deals with risk as well, both positive risk, which are opportunities and negative risks, which are threats. So we'll talk about um, it, you know, that, that uncertainty domain in, uh, in week three. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, I believe that some of the other questions may actually be answered in some of your next slides talking about diligence, respect and caring stewardship. So I'll hand over back to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. So um, this is just really going through in a bit more detail uh, the, the previous kind of slide that captured all of the, the, the 12 principles together. So this is just sort of going through them in a bit more detail. So um, being the, the diligent, caring steward, um, you can see there that the four dot points really are about what stewardship is about. So as I said earlier, you know, we, we have a big responsibility here on our hands. We're taking uh, the, the organisation's resources, the money, the time, uh, and we're endeavouring to turn around a product, service or result that, that is going to be uh, adding value to the organisation. We're going to try and run this project to the, to the standards that are set out by the PMO and, and trying to please our governance layer um, and all the, team, all the while trying to you know, run the team and keep that going smoothly as well. So it's a, it's a pretty big ask. Um, but stewardship is about that integrity and that care uh, and being a trustworthy person. Uh, you know, you do have authority to act on behalf of the, the organisation a lot of times. So things like, for example, signing contracts on behalf of the organisation. You know, so you want to make sure that you are acting with integrity and care, that you're complying with all of the different rules and regulations of the organisation, you're complying with all of the policies and procedures, and that you're, you're complying with the law as well. So um, it's not just in relation to procurement, it's all kinds of things, you know, but basically resource management. So, um, you know, we're, we're responsible for the resources that we use. We don't want to be wasting resources. And in fact, a lot of the agile methods, you know, really talk about uh, a lean way of thinking, reducing waste and, and, you know, being really super careful about, you know, how, how you, you manage your resources and, and keeping uh, everything, you know, um, you know, just what's needed and that's all. Um, and uh, this is, you know, a commitment to that social and financial uh, and environmental you know, sustainability. Uh, so making sure that that's, um, that's covered uh, is part of this, um, this principle of, um, of uh, behaviour for project managers. Then we've got uh, the project team and its environment. So as I mentioned before, you know, we've got this project team, it's made up of different people. And everyone who knows people knows that they come from different backgrounds, they have different skills, they have different knowledge, different experience, uh, different perceptions of things. And we have a responsibility to try to get those people to work together as a whole and as a team um, to, to achieve this shared objective. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people that are working on our project teams might be part of uh, another part of the organisation as well. So oftentimes we see, and some of you may have this in your own workplaces, where you're, you're doing your day job, but you're also on three or four projects. Okay, so you might be a subject matter expert or you might be a project manager on a couple of projects, plus you've got your day job to do as well. And so not only then are your people affected by the team culture in the project team, but they're affected by the team culture in the other project teams and the team culture within their day-to-day -day job team as well. So, um, you know, we have to be really aware of that, really mindful of how uh, members of the team are coming to us and making sure that we're supporting them and, you know, helping them to feel uh, you know, like they're, they're making a worthwhile contribution in the project. Uh, so making sure that we've, we've got people aligned uh, and that we're providing basically a team environment that's conducive to them getting results and, and performing really well uh, and that we're getting the optimal contributions out of each of the people that are on our project team. All right, uh, engaging stakeholders. A lot of the similar skills that are required to manage the team are also used to manage the other stakeholders as well. But this one is more around making sure you're proactive in your stakeholder engagement. Uh, so I'm sure you can all think of examples of projects that didn't go very well uh, because the wrong people were involved or the right people were involved but too late in the project. So this one is about making sure that stakeholders who are going to have an interest in the project and who are going to influence the project have an opportunity to come forward at the beginning and make a contribution to that project success. Uh, so it's about proactively 
uh, working with people, building rapport with your stakeholders, you know, making sure that they all know what their role is, what their responsibility is and what you want from them. They know how to make a contribution. They know why their contribution is needed and, and why it's worthwhile uh, and, and really helping your project team to kind of get the most out of the project stakeholders so that, uh, you know, everyone feels valued and important. Uh, then we've got our focus on value. Uh, so as I said before, uh, this one is, is something that's uh, come about as a result of the agile mindset. And the agile mindset tells us that value is, is everything, that value is the ultimate indicator of project success. I can run a project to scope and to schedule and to budget, but if I don't produce an outcome that my customer thinks is a valuable or beneficial outcome, then I've failed, essentially. So what we're saying here is that, um, you know, we need to make sure that value is being realised throughout the project and that the benefits that, that um, we're hoping to achieve at the start of the project are delivered at the end and can be measured in quantifiable or qualifiable terms. Um, and that the focus here is on the outcomes rather than the work itself. I think sometimes as project managers, we get so wound up about our schedules and our budgets uh, that we actually lose sight of the, the end result sometimes. So this is about focusing on that end result, focusing on the value that you're going to create uh, and making sure that your project is aligned with the strategic objectives of the organisation and is taking the organisation forward towards its, its strategic objectives, not, not away from, uh, and, and making sure that all of the resources that are, that are applied to the project are being used to create something of value. Uh, our systems thinking and our systems interaction. So as I said before, making sure that we look at the project in a holistic way, that it's not just a separate budget and a separate schedule and a separate procurement plan, but looking at how all of these interdependent and interacting domains of activity come together and work together to produce an actual project. So, uh, you know, obviously our systems are constantly changing. Uh, there's, there's lots of things, moving parts with projects that we've got to keep an eye on, uh, but we've got to make sure that we're able to respond to, to any system interactions and, and make sure that our team gets a, a positive outcome out of that. Leadership behaviours. Uh, so again, just making sure that, uh, that we are leading and that we're encouraging other people to lead too. One of the things that is uh, really important to recognise is it's not just up to the project manager to lead the project team. It's also up to all of the people that are on the project team to be leaders as well. Uh, so anyone can be a leader. It doesn't necessarily go with a title um, that any project team member should be out there championing the project and, you know, uh, demonstrating leadership behaviours. But of course, it really does start with, with you as the PM. Uh, so if you've got a project manager who, who doesn't exhibit effective leadership behaviours, then the rest of the project team won't either. Um, it, is, it is important to make sure that that's a, a top-down modelled uh, approach uh, and that, you know, you're, you're out there promoting the success of the project at, at every opportunity uh, and that you're adapting your style to suit the needs of the, of the project as well and the needs of the people that you're dealing with. So sometimes you need to, to act with authority and you need to be really decisive and you need to say, this is how it's going to be, guys, and we're just going to have to get on with the job here. And other times you might say, what do you think? How do you want to go about this? You know, what, what sort of solutions would you propose for, for this particular problem? Um, and so it is a matter of choosing the right approach at the right time for the right people that you're trying to lead. Uh, and again, trying to get that social influence happening on your project so that, uh, you know, people feel as though that they can go to you for their support needs and, uh, and, and go to you for, uh, you know, the, when, they're, when they're needing help with their performance or, or, you know, they're having issues with their motivation and things like that. Uh, tailoring. So again, uh, as we've discussed, that there's there's not uh, you know one best way of, of delivering a, a project. That you know the development approach that we we choose should be based on what's needed in the situation. So based on the stakeholders, the governance, the environment, uh, making sure that we've we've done enough, um, but you know we're not wasting resources and we're not wasting time and money. Um, and again, you know it, it, that question we had earlier about you know who who gets to choose the 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 approach, um, the project manager gets to make some some day-to-day -day decisions about what models what methods what artifacts he or she might choose to use and we'll talk a lot about that in week four um, but but tailoring basically appreciates the fact 
fact that every project is unique. And the ultimate say on the, on the approach, whether it's going to be waterfall or agile or whatever those big ticket things kind of sit with the sponsor and the steering committee, that governance layer. But there's lots of everyday decisions that project managers and project team members make as well that can really influence whether or not the project is a success. Um, and it's our ability to be able to choose the right method and, and not just choose the right method, but be able to, to change the method if things aren't working as well. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a process of continuous improvement throughout the project as things are unfolding. Uh, building quality in, so having that, that, that focus on quality, making sure our deliverables that we turn out are, you know, performing to the expected standard uh, and that we're focused on, you know, meeting that acceptance criteria that our stakeholders have given us, uh, making sure that, you know, whatever we're doing is, is appropriate and effective and, and meets requirements. Navigating complexity, as I said before, making sure all of that, that people, systems, processes, stuff all works together uh, and that any problems that you might encounter along the way are, are dealt with uh, and, you know, staying vigilant to be able to, you know, identify potential hazards ahead and being able to respond to those and, and, uh, and work through them, you know, as the project goes on. And risk, uh, we had the question before about where risk fits in. Risk fits in here, of course, in one of our performance, uh, sorry, one of our guiding uh, behaviours, but it also fits in in the uncertainty performance domain as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we do, uh, we are constantly exposed to risk on projects. Uh, there is not a single day that goes by that we don't um, have a, an exposure to some kind of new threat or opportunity uh, in the project. So we do need to obviously be very vigilant about that, um, but we also need to be quite prepared as well. So we should involve our stakeholders in the risk management approach uh, and making sure that we've, we've thought of risk responses before the risks actually occur and be ready to go with, with cost-effective and appropriate uh, risk responses once uh, we do encounter them. Uh, adaptability and resiliency, obviously being able to, to encounter setbacks and, and not lose momentum. We've got to be able to keep the project team humming along and sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge when we do have setbacks and things happen. Uh, we've got to be able to absorb the impact of those and, and make some changes and, and keep the pro project moving in a, in a forward direction. Um, and that's that focus on outcomes rather than uh, you know, the work that has to be done as well. And uh, change management, I did see a... a um, uh, a question there before um, and in relation to being a good change manager you do have to have good change management skills to be a project manager you are helping people uh, to to achieve a, a future state uh, and as a result of that some people don't like change they resist change they're scared of change they're suffering from change fatigue um, all of those sorts of things uh, can happen uh, and so you know if, if you're going to try to, uh, to get people to change, you've got to come overcome all of that. You've got to try to motivate people to, to want to change. Uh, and that can be quite tricky, particularly in the modern business environment. So uh, that's one of the things that we've got to keep in our mind and one of our uh, desired uh, behaviours that we've got to keep uh, in, the, in, in our kit bag as we go through the project. So that's it for my presentation. I'll hand back to Jack because you might have some more questions. Do we, Kit or Jack, have we got more questions? We do, we do. Um, just a couple of quick uh, sort of housekeeping type questions as well. We will have three more of these courses uh, at the same time each week for the next three weeks. So that's 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time or wherever that is uh, equivalent to in your time zone. Uh, they'll all be uploaded online. They will be uploaded to YouTube as well as accessible via the learn.itmasters .edu.au page that you can all log into with your uh, logins for this course. Um, we do have a fair few questions in the chat. Some of them may be um, a little bit specific for some of this, um, but we'll see how we go getting through each of them. Um, oh, so quick, here's one that's more, um, you know, sort of uh, straight up and down uh, with PMBOK 7, is classroom training a prerequisite for the exam? No, I don't. Well, at the moment, the exam is still on PMBOK 6. So uh, I, I imagine that PMI have plans to, to change the content of the exam to, to reflect the, the 7 content, uh, but that hasn't been done yet. Um, but it, it can be done as an online exam now. So that's something that happened during COVID. COVID's given us something good. <laughs> no need to turn up at a testing centre for two hours and do a multiple choice exam anymore. 
That is handy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are also uh, uh, asking if uh, is the artifact that you've mentioned similar to artifacts used with agile methodology? Yeah, yeah, exactly the same thing. So an artifact is a is a, an output of the of the project. So, uh, for example, if I deliver, if I produce a Gantt chart or a schedule, that's an artifact. If I, you know, produce a or I, I prepare a contract or something, that's an artifact. So artifacts are things that we're creating um, that aren't the product, service, or result themselves, but are byproducts of having completed the project. Great, great. Okay. Um, Greg asks, how do you identify that putting two projects together will deliver value? Uh, so one of the things to be really careful about before we decide to just go and slap any two pro projects together is that we are going to achieve a greater benefit by doing so than what we would if we delivered them separately. So think of it as like the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because when we do decide to run a program and put two projects together and run it as a program, we are adding an extra layer of governance there. So instead of just having a project manager for project A and a project manager for project B, we then have a program manager that sits over the top of that as well. And instead of just having a steering committee and a sponsor for project A and project B, we've got a program, um, you know, steering committee as well. So uh, it does add complexity. Uh, you would want to be saving money or saving time time or you know creating some sort of other major gain for the organization before you start putting those sorts of projects together to make programs great great um uh, very quick question uh will you be discussing project management tools at any point throughout the short course yes yes so week four so we've done the the 12 principles that guide behavior the next two weeks we're going to focus on the eight performance domains so i'll cover four in the first week next week then four in that week number three uh, and then the last week we're going to be talking about tailoring and we're going to be talking about models methods and artifacts and tools as part of that as well great great um okay um how do you know that you've met the quality outcome so we set the quality outcomes up at the beginning of the project. So that's something that the stakeholders will, will tell us. They'll tell us the acceptance criteria or the quality requirements that they want us to achieve. So whether you're doing agile and you're just doing a, a section, you might just at the start of your, your iteration just, just define the quality requirements and then go and deliver them. And then at the end, you measure to see whether or not you've achieved them. Whereas if you're doing a predictive or waterfall project, you'd set the quality criteria for the whole project and then you'd go and deliver the project and then you do your measurements to make sure that you've met your quality requirements at the end. Brilliant. And uh, just a note for everyone, we are closing the Q&A section now as we only have a limited amount of time and a few questions to kind of get through. Um, uh, thank you, Kit, as well. Um, so another question is, what is the difference? And I believe you uh, went into this uh, very slightly at the beginning of the course. Uh, just briefly, what's the difference between agile and traditional project management? Yep. So traditional project management or waterfall or predictive project management means that what we're going to do is we're going to plan the whole project first. So think of something like a house build, right? So we go to council, we get our plans, we get approval, then we you know do this, the, the slab and the, the, the trusses and frames, and then we get the, the house to lock up stage. But we don't actually start anything until we've planned the whole thing. So we can't just go to the, the, the council and say, look, I'm going to build a house and I don't really know what it's going to look like, but let me get started and I'll let you know. Um, so we go in and we make sure everything's planned to the nth degree, and then we get started on the project. So that's waterfall project. So it, it's traditional and it's the approach that, that most project managers, you know, 60s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s kind of did. Then we, we realised that the, uh, the business environment was a bit too volatile for that to work for some kinds of projects. So, you know, think about something like an iPhone. Um, by the time you planned every aspect of that, that product release, you would then be at the point where all of that technology would be obsolete. So the idea is there that you're going to uh, design a little bit, make a little bit, then go and design a little bit more, and then go and make a little bit more, and then go and design a little bit more after that and make a little bit more. So agile is, uh, it's not make it up as you go along, please don't think that, but it is an approach where you're creating a minimum viable product and then you're adding on to that with, with different features and functions and evolving a product to fruition rather than planning everything from the beginning. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got another one. 
saying, how do you ensure the human aspect of these principles, for example, the change uh, or a change in the person responsible for the particular project may lead to change in how the project is perceived? A little bit more of a nebulous question there. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So it is a bit of a behavioural thing. Uh, and this is where change management skills can come in because it teaches you about human behaviour and why people might resist change uh, and why people might be fearful of it or fatigued by it. Or, you know, so one of the, one of the things about project management is that, you know, there are the, the sort of the technical skills, being able to develop a schedule and a budget and a procurement plan and a risk management plan, you know, all of those sorts of things that, that traditionally project managers do. But there is a softer skill side of this as well. Uh, and that is that leadership behaviours, communication, negotiation, conflict resolution. That's equally, if not more important, because you can learn how to do a Gantt chart and you can learn how to do a, a budget. But unless you can learn how to be an effective leader, you won't get a project off the ground. You still with us, Jack? Yes, sorry. I was oh, saying that was okay. a fantastic answer and I had myself muted. That's um, right. We've got I thought two... I'm going to have to drive this thing from now on. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm, I'm still behind the wheel. Um, so we've got two. I'll read one and then the other out that go together quite well. Uh, Jessica asks, in adapting to business agility for business sustainability reasons, many large organisations are moving towards product management driven way of working. Uh, how do you think this affects the project management professional field? Um, and then also um, kind of coming into that uh, uh, two, actually, I'm going to pop three together if, if that's okay. Uh, the next one is, can you elaborate on the broad commitment required by project managers regarding social and environmental impacts? And then finally, expectation management comes up a lot when considering stakeholder management in my experience and where does this fit? So basically about the, uh, yeah, going around the sort of defining of the project management professional field and managing the expectations and stakeholders all together. Is it okay to answer those three questions together? I started I'll do my best. Uh, answer, <laughs> asking and then I was like, oh, this actually might be a bit much. No, that's okay. I'll do my best. So one of the things that we, we see in project management is, is a lot of evolution. So you can see here that the block has been completely rewritten for seven than it was for six. Um, and, and that's an acknowledgement that these um, elements of the business environment, whether it's product management, change management, project management, continuous improvement, what, whatever you're talking about, these, these things all come together in the end. It's really kind of another string to, to, to the existing bow, if you, if you get what I'm saying. So, um, you know, eventually all of this will, will kind of mesh together. What we're talking about here essentially is business improvement. And so product management has a role to play in that. Project management has a role to play in that. Change management has a role to play in that. Uh, and as these things mature and progress, we're seeing a blurring of the lines between them. That's for sure. So, um, you know, that, that's a good point that's been made there. And, and how it comes together and how it's balanced and how it's, how it's um, separated and, and kept in its own domains is going to be something that's going to be discussed a lot, I think, in the future of project management. Where do we fit in versus where all those other elements fit in? And there's going to have to be decisions made by organisations in terms of how they structure themselves to be able to deal with that complexity as well. So the second part of that, uh, Jack, was... Uh, about the sustainability, was it? Yes, yeah, about the uh, the um, commitment to uh, uh, social and environmental impacts. Can you yeah, elaborate yeah. So on we those? Do, we do have to be mindful of that. And, and some of these principles that guide behaviour talk about that, um, particularly if you're managing projects, uh, you know, in a particular method. So like the lean method, for example, talks about waste minimisation and, and, you know, being really mindful of, of you know, things like, uh, you know, not doing things too early and, and you know, not, not um, wasting your resources, making sure that you're only using just enough to be able to get the job done. Um, and so there is that greater social and environmental awareness now and, and, and we're starting to see, you know, the box responsive to that by putting it in these 12 principles that guide behaviour. So I think we'll just see more of those themes in the, in the coming years. Can I just add there too, one of the, one of the assessments for MGI 511 asks students to choose a concept that's emerged in the last 10 years of the, of the modern business environment and to talk about how project management has been impacted by that event. 
or that that um, situation or that that concept. So it might be something like what you're talking about there, or it could be you know, just something like COVID, for example. But the student gets to choose their their chosen concept and gets to to talk about you know how project management has been affected and will continue to be affected by you know these concepts because ultimately project management is just like everything else; it's affected by the external environment. Uh, so you know our projects don't operate in a vacuum. We we have to be able to you know. Um, modify our, our responses to, to a changing environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, from uh, speaking of changing environments, talking about the process, uh, the, the change from uh, PM BOC six to seven, uh, do you consider the process groups in former PM BOC editions have to be abandoned? I wouldn't say abandoned altogether. You're still doing the processes. Whether you do a waterfall project or an agile project, you're still kicking a project off, which is what initiating is. Uh, you're still planning, whether you're planning the whole project up front or you're just planning a sprint or an iteration. Uh, you're still executing project work, whether you're doing the whole lot or you're doing just the iteration. Uh, and, and you're still monitoring and controlling. You're still make, keeping an eye on your project uh, and making sure that, you know, it's it's going according to the, the budget and the schedule. You're still doing that you know, for each iteration or for the whole project. And, and you're still closing off your project and handing over and doing those transition activities. So I wouldn't say that they're, they're obsolete. Uh, they're, they're still very much utilised. Um, and I guess PMBOK are just trying to find a way or the PMI are trying to find a way to kind of weave more of the, the adaptive stuff in. Um, and I think the, the, the BOC was probably unfairly, but associated with waterfall project management because those five process groups seem like the, the, the waterfall life cycle, people just automatically assume that PMBOK was waterfall. Um, and you can see that it's not. You can see that you, you do those five process groups even on an agile project. You're just doing them multiple times for each iteration. Um, but they're moving away from that. I, I wouldn't say it's obsolete, but I, I would say that um, there's definitely a shift in the mindset here towards... Uh, a bit more of a fluid um, process. Great, great. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking of uh, speaking of that, is there an easy way to merge agile and waterfall type projects and the corresponding methods slash reports slash resource slash work management? An easy way? Probably not. A way, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so lots of organisations are doing that now. Uh, lots of organisations are hybridising methodologies because they're seeing because of their product or because of, uh, of their organisation or their structure or the industry that they're in, they're seeing some real benefits of, of waterfall project management and being able to predict some of the outcomes and they're seeing some real benefits in being able to adapt to change and, and do some of the lean or the Kanban sort of method stuff. Uh, and so they're bringing those together uh, and, and trying to create hybrid methodologies. Lots of organisations are doing that. The benefit is that you get best of both worlds. Uh, the downside is that if you've got uh, a, an organisation that's not quite ready for that in its project management maturity, that can be a bit of an issue trying to, to teach it and, and embed it uh, in an organisation without that sort of project management background and maturity. But it can be done. All right. Okay. Excellent. Um, so... Uh... Yes, uh, Hassam asks, how is tailoring an iterative process? So we, we make some decisions at the beginning of our project about what we're going to do uh, and, and we're tailoring to the, to the needs of the project, but we have to be prepared to make changes to that and to tweak that tailoring as we go. So we'll talk to about tailoring a lot more in week four of the short course, uh, but there, there are decisions that you, you might need to make throughout that, that require you to retailer or, or tweak your tailoring as you go. Right. Okay. Um, fantastic. So Tracy's asked uh, with leadership style slash styles uh, and using a range from collaborative to decisive, how do you ensure you don't come across as inconsistent? Uh, so there's a thing called situational leadership, 
Uh, and it, it's not born out of project management, it's a general management thing. Uh, and, you know, it, it talks about, you know, choosing the right approach in the right situation. And, and you know, that's, uh, that's pretty important. Um, anyone considering a, a career in project management, I think really needs to have good leadership skills. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't recommend anyone launch a career in project management, just having done a project management course. I think a lot of uh, leadership skills are so important, but so overlooked in a lot of formalised project management management training that you know I'd be I'd be looking at, uh, at taking on some additional courses even things like being able to run meetings properly you know you might not think that that's a, a skill that that is very difficult but you know you get a couple of hundred people in a meeting you know to, to try and a stakeholder meeting to, to try and gauge requirements and things like that and you know all of a sudden you can start to lose control of things so some of those softer skills are definitely uh, need to be learned by the project manager for sure. And the better the project manager, the, the better the leader. So, Great, great. Okay. Um, fantastic. So uh, what would you suggest or recommend a project manager do if they notice more threats than opportunities in the project management process? Get ready. <laughs> um, so usually there will be a bit of a combo of, of threats and opportunities. The other thing is to be mindful that we identify the threats and opportunities at the beginning of the project. And that could even start right when we kick the project off with our assumptions. We, we usually tend to, to make some assumptions at the beginning of the project uh, as a basis upon which to move forward. That's sort of the birthplace of your early risks. Uh, so we should be recording those and, and being ready. Early stakeholder engagement helps because they will continue to identify uh, new threats and new opportunities as the project goes on but the most important thing is that we never lose sight of risks when we're talking about the uncertainty performance domain uh, in a couple of weeks I'll talk to you about this again um, but new risks can come at any point in time in the project it's not a you know do it in the plan phase if you're doing waterfall projects and, and then just pop it on the shelf and forget about it you need to continuously keep risk at the forefront of your mind and, and encourage your stakeholders to continue to identify new risks uh, and risks can change in nature you might have identify them at the start of the project but as the project sort of kicks on you know they're more likely to happen or less likely to happen or they might have a greater impact or a lesser impact so at all times you should have your finger on the pulse in relation to your threats and opportunities and, and your stakeholders should be you know feeding you that information constantly great okay and our last question is from gary uh, who asks isn't expecting the project manager to be the change manager a bridge too far isn't that like expecting the project manager being the systems analyst and the systems architect? I think there's roles for project manager and, and change manager to work separately and, and to have different responsibilities. I guess where Pimbok is coming from with this is to say that um, we have a, a responsibility, maybe not necessarily as the change manager, but as a champion of change um, and, and to be able to work hand in hand with the project manager to make sure that our project delivers a successful change. Um, for smaller, less complicated, simple projects, being the project manager and the change manager can, can be quite quite easy and, and quite, well, not easy, um, but, but quite a, a good good um, you know alignment uh, and, and there's not really you know uh, a need for two separate roles but on some quite big complex commercial projects you certainly wouldn't want to be the change manager and the project manager there should definitely be the two um, but you're working together for the same outcome ultimately. Brilliant all right thank you very much Karen uh, and now we have reached the end of our questions thank you extremely uh, extremely much Oh, oh dear, very much, Karen, for an extremely interesting and informative session. Um, this was really fantastic. I hope everybody that is viewing it live and also viewing it in recording has enjoyed it and found it informative. Um, for people, uh, just a reminder, um, all of the webinar materials will be made available as soon as possible, generally within 24 hours, although I believe that the slides for this are already up. Um, and the recordings will be uploaded uh, within 24 hours at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for all of your questions and uh, comments that led to anything. Uh, if this uh, short course, uh, which by the way, again, will be continuing for another three weeks at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, on a Thursday evening, um, if this course has got you really interested in studying this field in a more kind of comprehensive um, manner that gets you an official degree or qualifications, IT Masters uh, does offer um, 
content that this uh, short course is taken from as part of MGI 511, Project Management Fundamentals, taught by the wonderful Karen um, as part of the Graduate Certificate, Diploma or uh, Masters of Project Management. Um, and if you're interested in studying that, feel free to check out uh, whether or not uh, you're eligible to study. Um, I'm going to just drop the eligibility link um, in the uh, chat now. Um, and uh, you might even speak to me on the phone if you are, if you're so lucky uh, to have your eligibility assessed. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, we'll see you here next week. And uh, yeah, have a lovely week. Stay safe, take care of yourselves and uh, have a good morning, evening, afternoon or night, depending on where you are. Thanks, everyone.